But uh, this, this is Duba. This is Duba, and he uh, was the camp speaker just a couple weeks ago. He's a pastor down in Woodland, California. And get this, he is from, he is from, I, I'm pretty sure it's either Uganda or Ethiopia, but he was adopted at a month old, okay, a month old, and he has five to six other siblings, and they were all adopted by the same family in Woodland, California. And so he went on to work at a ranch with this family, but then he's like, I am, I am done with, I'm done with this work. I am ready to uh, be a pastor. <laughs> he, he was, he was pretty uh, wore out from all of it. But he uh, went through Ephesians, and he said something that has stayed with me, and I wasn't sure when to bring it up until now. Today's the passage, but uh, Duba was going through Ephesians, and he says, "You know what Christians are missing? They're missing wow." And I was like, "What? What are you talking about?" We just read Ephesians 2, where you and I were dead in sin, alienated from God and our Creator. God made you alive. Amen? Wow! <laughs> wow! And so he gave a whole bunch of other examples. He said, we've got to start thinking in wow terms. And so I wanted us to practice today. I'm serious now. Let's on three. Let, I want to hear a wow. One, two, three. Wow! Wow! Thank you. Somebody right here. The rest of you are dismissed. Dale, tell us that. Okay, because you got to say wow, and I'm like, wow, i got to put up with this guy? Like, no, wow. With reverence, awe, celebration. Wow. Okay, so one more time. Can we do this? One, two, three. Wow. Okay, because we're going to get ready to say it. Bill, that was pretty bad. I know why. Okay, that was pretty bad. Okay, I want some wow. So, I, I mean, if I'm being totally, totally open, I want to be a wow church. I want, to, I want to just be able to say, wow, look at what God's doing. David, we read just a couple weeks ago, you read some letters from some of the students. And what was the first thing you said? Wow. It was wow. Yeah. It was a quiet, it was a quiet, but it was still that humble. It was still look what God was doing. It's like, wow. That's what I, 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 want, I want to be that church, right? I don't know what that looks like, but we're going to see some wow stuff today. So get ready to say, wow. Thank you, Bill. I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to... to Dismissed from the class. So I, I need to hear a wow, man. Come on, mister. Is this one of those vote no things? Like, I'm just going to do the opposite. We, we want to be a wow church. Let's look. Revelation 11, verse 11. We've got these two witnesses. Last week, they were killed. They were killed. But three days later, the breath of life from God came into them. They stood on their feet. Great fear fell upon those who were, were reholding them. I think we all can pause right here on three. One, two, three. Wow. wow. The guys were dead in the street. <sighs> the whole world saw it. Saw it. And then they got up three days later. Amen. Wow. That's incredible. Verse 12. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven say to them, come up here. They went into heaven and their enemies beheld them. Wow, we're on verse 2. Here we are, 1, 2, 3. Wow. wow. You literally watch these guys. Go, what is happening? That's incredible. That's incredible. Verse 13. <clears throat> and in that hour, there was a great earthquake. A tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The rest were terrified and gave glory to the God in heaven. Folks, verse 13, we had a major earthquake. None of us would ever say something exciting after an earthquake. We'd be terrified. We'd be, what is it they say? Stand in the doorway, right? To not get killed. Instead, we have revival right here. I think number three, one, two, three. Wow. Like, that's incredible. Are you kidding me? There's a revival. There's a revival <laughs> right there after an earthquake. Verse 14. Now we're going to stop on the wow's right. The second woe is past. Behold, the third one's coming. Uh oh. Okay, that's, yeah, there we go, Rebecca. That's, that's a, get ready because it's scary. Verse 15. The seventh angel sounds, blows the trumpet. There arose loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He will reign forever and ever. One, two, three. Wow. wow. Our Savior. Guys, there it is. It's all over. Jesus is reigning. Wow. <laughs> I mean, hello? That's exciting. So there it is. All that to say, chapter 11, verse 15, it's over. Jesus wins. All right there. It's a good, it's a good wow, but it, again, it 
kind of came quick, right? Verse 16, the 24 elders, after they hear that Jesus reigns forever, they, they sit on their thrones. What do they do? They fall on their faces and they worship. That's our Savior, folks. Wow. Verse 17, we give thanks to you, O Lord, the Almighty, who art, who was, because you have taken your great power and you are beginning to reign. Wow. I mean, it becomes more reverential, doesn't it? Wow. Our God is reigning forever and ever. Verse 18, the nations, they're enraged. The wrath came. The time came for the dead to be judged. The time to give their reward to your bond servants, the prophets, to the saints, to those who fear your name, the small and the great. Everyone is basically going to be judged. Verse 18 continues. And to those who have destroyed the earth. Verse 19, the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened. The ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, sounds of peals, thunder, an earthquake, great hailstorms. Folks, you're in heaven in verse 19. Wow. One, two, three. Wow. That's incredible. Miguel, would you pray for us? Father God, we do thank you, Lord. And it is time to Okay, before we get going, one, two, three. Wow. wow. All right, there we go. There we go, there we go. As you guys know, we, 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 we look through here one, real quick. Again, we're, we're on. There it is. It just got blown, the seventh trumpet, and that led to victory. And we all said, wow, yeah, this is exciting. And then we are going to, to pause here. We're going to kind of have uh, the next, probably the next month, we will have basically, not foreshadowing, but kind of a, a recap of how did, how did the Antichrist become the Antichrist? Like a little background story, a little flashback, what's taking place to lead to all that, and then bam, those seven bulls, which is the, the final wrath of God, it is going to come very swift, very fast, and folks, it's only going to come to those who are not saved. Amen. That's it. Those are, that's all that's left. God's done everything he can to get people saved. We saw last week, chapter 11, these two guys... Uh, we don't know who they are. A lot of scholars think Elijah or Moses, but we don't know. They're going to prophesy for three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months. And we left last week. Who kills them? Let's look one more time real quick. Verse 7, verse 7 of chapter 11. When they finish their testimony, the beast, this is the Antichrist. He comes out of this abyss. He's going to make war and he's going to kill them. That's that's some wild stuff, right? That's a that's a weird wow. Not not a, a humble, graceful, uh, awe type wow. But we see that that the Antichrist is allowed to kill them. Repeat, the Antichrist who is a man is able to kill them. And so we we left last week with that perspective, like man, this is a down down in the dumps day. Looks like it's over. Like we lost, or or it's just really really sad. But nope. Our perspective is not always happy. Let's just be honest. It's never what God's perspective is, isn't it? And verse, verse 11 is where we pick up today. After the, the Christmas holiday of wishing and, and celebrating that these guys are dead. Verse 11. Three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them. They stood on their feet. Great fear fell upon those who were beholding them. We see here that, uh, again, if you, you have your notes, uh, we have a ton of similarities. Just to be very, very clear, I'm not saying uh, this is the resurrection, but all of us would agree. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. That is the foundation. Amen. Like without, without him doing that, you are not saved. But the resurrection is just as important, right? He had to, again, take care of our debt by actually... Being able to pay for it as God. He rises again on the third day according to the scriptures. Hallelujah. And again we see the power of God. Very, very similar in verse 11. After three days. Right? The resurrection. The breath of life. That, that idea here of breath of life is the, the spirit. The Holy Spirit brings the revival into them. And so they, they come to life. And it says that they stood on their feet. And great fear fell 
upon those who were beholding them. Okay, great fear. Great fear. This is a wild moment. Like, oh my goodness, these guys, we were all celebrating. Their dead bodies were there. Wait a minute, they just got up and just stood up on their feet. I mean, that's incredible. That's incredible. And so as you guys see, the, the idea of fear is so important here because it's where we get the word phobia. Okay, I can't speak for you guys. I'm not a needle guy. I'm not a needle guy. This, this is the, some of you aren't snakes or spiders. I get it. Some of you. Public speaking would kill you. Okay. So there's this great fear. There's this megos. Like, they are so terrified. Phobia. They are mega. It's been enhanced. That They are just stunned at what they are witnessing. They're scared to death. They are scared to death. And then verse 12. They heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud. Their enemies beheld them. They are all watching this. They're all watching this. Again, this is very similar as you see Acts chapter 1, the disciples and many other witnesses. Jesus ascends. They saw it, folks. They saw him in the same manner that Jesus is going up. He's going to come back. That's what the angel says. Hallelujah. Because we're, we're at that moment. I'm very, very close here where Jesus is going to rule forever and ever. And he's going to come back as our victorious king and the world will be judged. So again, we have this wow moment. Look at that, guys. The enemies were watching this. They're stunned. What is happening? Verse 13. And in that hour, there was a great, great earthquake. A tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The rest were terrified. They gave glory to the God of heaven. Oh my goodness. There's a great earthquake again. Uh, if you look on the screen, you'll see uh, that we have the, the Megos. That's the same word here. So there's this really, really big earthquake. Like the Richter scale can't even contain it. Can't even contain it. It's monstrous. But notice it only gets a tenth of the city. Only a tenth of the city. Why is that important? Because we're going to see that <coughs> Satan, Satan, the beast, the Antichrist, there's somehow they have ten either horns or, or ten faces. The idea basically is that there's ten nations that have agreed to go along with this deception, to, to go along with worshiping Satan. And so the ten, that means one tenth of them is one of those nations is wiped out. So whether it's Greece, you know, Romans, I mean, I, I don't know. We won't get into that. Whether it's Asia, I don't know. But one of them is just gone. One of them is gone, wiped out. A tenth of the city is gone. How many people are killed? 7,000 people are killed. Again, if, you were to, if we were to look back at the crucifixion in Matthew, Luke, you'll have Jesus. He's crucified. And what does Jesus say? It is finished. And what happens? Darkness and a big earthquake. And the temple is torn. Just the temple. Again, we have very specifics here in verse 13. Just a tenth of the city. Not the whole city. Just these people are killed, 7,000. And I can't believe I'm saying this in a, uh, in a wow moment, but only 7,000 people are killed, folks. Remember, we've seen in chapter, what, three and four, millions, if not millions, are killed. We know that uh, then we had the great earthquake that basically completely upends the world in chapter eight and nine. Billions of potential people are killed. Here, just 7,000. It's very, very specific. Again, it'd be a wow moment if it's still not like, wow, that's kind of kind of shocking, isn't it? Verse 13. You've got this great earthquake. The rest of the people are terrified. They are terrified. So as you can as you can see on the screen, the, the idea here is they're alarmed in the Greek, right? That something is this is so shocking, like, man, I better pay attention to what's taking place. And what happens? They give glory to God. They do have revival. There are some at this moment that come to salvation. Amen. I mean, hallelujah. I think, I think we're ready here. They come to salvation. One, two, three. Wow. I mean, in the midst of an earthquake, they come to salvation. So similar. So similar to the resurrection. Remember the Roman guard? This man was the son of God. This is the guy. This is it. There was a many, many, one person salvation on the day our Lord was crucified, along with the prisoner, right? He was right there. We've done wrong. This man hasn't done anything. Remember me when you come into paradise. 
right? Two people that we know are saved on that horrible day of crucifixion. Here we have a lot of people giving glory. How about Jonah? They toss Jonah over, in the, and what happens to the storm? It stops, and there is a many around those guys, those pagans. They worship the Lord. They're like, I don't know what's going on, but we're trusting the Lord. This is unbelievable. Wow, that's incredible. And so there's, there's this mini, mini revival. Verse 14. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. Again, if we were, if we were able to just turn in our Bibles just a couple pages over, you would, you would see that in chapter 8, verse 13, there's that eagle, right? He flies in heaven. He flies down. Chapter 8, verse 13, and he, he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. There are these, these things that are coming, these horrible, horrible judgments. The first one was demonic activity. On the earth, 200 million, 200 million, that's incredible. They had the power of a scorpion to sting and torment. That was the first woe. Now we come here to chapter 11. What's the second woe? Two witnesses preach the word of God, are brutally killed, and then are risen from the grave. Right there, they, they rise, and what happens? An earthquake, and people give glory to God. Wow. Wow. That's, a, that's an incredible woe right there. The woe, woe, woe. And now, verse 14, there's one more to go. There's one more to go. And unfortunately, it will be incorporated with the bulls that are really, really bad plagues. Okay? So this is the second woe. And remember, I, I, I don't mean to make light of this. Okay? But verse 14 is not, do totally stoner woe. Yeah, man. This is a grieving this is not, I want to do this. Whoa, look at what I just experienced. This is, it's terrible calamity that's coming. And there's still one more. There's still one more that's coming. Whew. Oh my goodness. Verse 15. Verse 15. Now the good news. The seventh angel blows his trumpet. Dun, dun, dun. It's all done, guys. All the trumpets. This is it. There arose loud voices in heaven. Why? Why are they so excited? Because the kingdom of the world is now the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, he's going to bring it all back together. Colossians chapter 1, he's the image of the invisible. Everything God wanted to bring through Jesus, everything back to himself. Because Jesus is our king. Hallelujah. Now that's a woe, right? One, two, three. Wow. <laughs> That's it right there. The kingdom of the world is now the kingdom of our Lord and his Jesus Christ. He will reign forever and ever. It's so important. So important. As you see uh, on, this, on the screen, okay, some of you are not going to like this. Okay, It's not my job to make sure you like it. It's my job to preach what it says. And so the kingdom of this world, I don't care what political party you are. I don't care what political party you are. I don't care who you vote for. I don't even care what issues you talk about. The word of God says that unless you have trusted Jesus Christ, you are in some way, shape, or form under some kind of satanic influence, some kind of authority. And folks, that means that the governors that you don't like, the politicians you don't like, if they're not saved, they are absolutely working in some weird way under satanic influence. Now, I'll leave it at that. But it's, it's a reason that we can easily look at some politicians and go, they support certain issues like killing babies. They support certain sinful issues, you know, regarding drugs and all that. Part of that's because they're literally under control of who? Under the world. That's satanic control. He's the prince of darkness. The, the apostle Paul cannot make it any more clear. Romans chapter 8. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against who? Rulers of darkness, spiritual darkness in the, in the present age. Guys, this goes all the way back even before the Apostle Paul and King Nero and all these horrible guys. They're all under some kind of control. So the question is, are we under the control of Jesus Christ or not? Okay, verse 15, the kingdom of the world, that satanic influence, which we will see in explicit detail over the next month, chapter 12, 13, 14, is now the kingdom of Jesus Christ. 
I mean, amen. It's now Jesus, guys. The trumpet's blown. It's over. Jesus is in charge. Woohoo! Not like he never was, but now it's official, right? We blew the trumpet. It's done. And, and what's so incredible here is I want you to, to look at this in your notes, okay? And I, and I try not to do this too much, but this is kind of a, a special term, okay? And it basically, in simplified terms, means something that's, pro, you know, prophecy, something that is in the future. Basically, it's already going to happen, all right? Okay, and to give to give a really practical example, I was racking my brain this week. There are only there's only two things I hear that we say are certain in life, and they are death and taxes. taxes. And all of you smile and shuffle like those are certain, aren't they? Because I in fact have seen my grandparents pass away, and I saw the bill from my mom in the mail within six months. You owe taxes on this inheritance, whatever. Like, you're kidding me. Death and taxes. It's a certainty. It's also kind of speaking of the future, isn't it? We are one day going to die. And we are one day, somebody, <laughs> unless you had a really good will and trust, right, are going to have to pay money on it. I also know, in a non-humorous way, some of you had disciplinary <clears throat> action taken against you when you were a small child, maybe even a teenager, in which your parents, I'm spitballing, of course, maybe said, go to your room while your father and I talk about this. And I, of course, knew what that meant. I mean, all of us knew what that meant, not just me. Uh, we were probably going to have some kind of disciplinary action on the backside, not naming names, not using any instruments, but something was going to occur in the future. And I, of course, like all of you, probably prayed, Lord, maybe they'll forget that I was a jerk. Maybe they'll forget I was disobedient to them. Maybe if we go to sleep, they'll forget that they need to take disciplinary action against my lack of respect towards them. That never occurred, but I'm still hopeful, just like all of you, right? There's that, that future, right? You're going to have some consequences in the disciplinary form. It will happen. Is it going to be 20 minutes, 12 hours? Maybe they forget. No, they won't. Okay. But it's going to happen, right? It's in the future. It's going to happen. That's what verse 15 is right here, guys. The kingdom of Jesus Christ and his reign. It's over. It's going to happen. It's already set in stone because the trumpet has blown. It's as good as done. Amen. <laughs> I think this is one of those appropriate wows because our king, Jesus Christ, is now reigning. Are we ready? One, two, three. Wow. That's exciting. Exciting. Ownership is now in the hands of of the person it belongs to, Jesus Christ. Verse 16, what's the instant reaction? The instant reaction. Worship. Look at verse 16. The 24 elders, they, they sit on the throne. They sit before God. They fall to their faces. And what do they do? They worship God. Let's, let's just think back, guys. Chapter 4, what we were in heaven, what caused worship? What caused worship was the holiness of God. What caused worship when we, when we saw the lamb in chapter 5 broken and bruised for us, his iniquity, right? The chastisement of God. We saw him bruised for our sin. It was he died on the cross for our sin. That was why we should worship. Why should we worship now? Because Jesus Christ is reigning forever and ever. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's incredible. I can think of no better way to continue and, and end that verse than that old hymn of the faith, right? Majesty. Worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Forever and ever. Verse 17, they continue. They continue to worship. These 24 elders, we give thanks, O oh God, the Almighty, who was, who art, and, and was, basically who is and has always been, because you have taken your great power and you have begun to reign. Again, God has always reigned. But God has always reigned. But what is happening now, guys, is it's officially now been reconciled and brought back to perfect harmony under Jesus and under his reign. Hallelujah. We give thanks to the Almighty. As you see on the screen, guys, so important. The Almighty there means ultimate, powerful. There is no other power outside of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's incredible. That is incredible. It's, again, another wow statement. It's just such an amazing word. It means absolute sovereign power. There is nothing above this. There's no Marvel Thanos thing. There's no, you know, Batman hero type grappling hook or cool toy. This is it. And Jesus possesses it because he is God. 
This is amazing. So if we were to read it again, we thank you, O Lord, because you and your sovereign power, you are the all-powerful one. You are the one whose power can do all this because you are God. Hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, that's just incredible. Uh, again, as you see on the screen, we are officially looking at Psalms chapter 2. Uh, as you look, some of you will see in verse 18 and 19, because it's all one thought, Psalms chapter 2, I encourage you to read that this week, is now bringing this, uh, this Psalms together in the, in the future sense of God's reign. It's all being brought together. It was written by David, but now it's brought to completion. It's brought to fulfillment. Wow. And what's, what's going to happen in the future under God's reign? What's going to happen? Look at verse 18. The nations didn't like it, did they? They tried to rebel against that power. Too bad, so sad. Because <laughs> you're going to submit. You're going to bow. The nations were going to see how they were enraged. We saw it in chapter 9, uh, excuse me, just verses 9 and 10, where they celebrated these uh, witnesses being killed. We're going to see it in chapters 12, 13, and 14, where they, they, they get angry at the things of God and his rule, his supreme rule. And you'll notice the idea here. Uh, oh, I did not put it up there. I apologize. The word enraged. It means defiant anger, right? Defiant rage. We're seeing, guys, no, no joke. Right now, you turn on the news, you got people protesting Roe versus Wade. You've seen people protest the last several years over who's our president, blah, blah, blah. Guys, that's 1% of the anger these people feel. They do not want God to rule over them. Satan does not want that. He fights it with every ounce of his being. And so that is just an anger so deep rooted in one soul. I, I, I can't fathom it, but I know it's in me as well, isn't it? Because all of us, we don't want to submit to God. We don't like that. But here we have the idea that these, these nations, so these ten nations that we're going to see, they are angry. But what happens in the future? God's wrath comes upon them. What else happens in the future? A time comes when the dead will be judged. The judge will be judged. And not just them, but a time will be given when you can be rewarded, right? Bond servants, prophets, saints, and to those who fear your great name. And there's going to be judgment, look at verse 18 at the end, on those who destroy the earth. Glendale Baptist Church, it doesn't matter what boat you are in, you're going to stand before the Lord at some time. It's going to happen. It's already, this is already a certainty. Remember, it's a prophetic. It's going to happen as certain as death and taxes. It's going to happen. And so the obvious question is, if I trusted Jesus so I can stand before and say, hey, man, I screwed up, but I trusted Jesus to pay the debt for my sin. I couldn't do it. I needed God's grace on the cross. Otherwise, it's not good. You can see this, the start of verse 18 and the end of verse 18. The time of God's wrath is going to come upon those, and it's also going to come upon those who destroy the earth. And just to be very, very clear, very, very clear, we're talking about unbelievers. The, the, the Greek here for, for those who destroy the earth are unbelievers. I want to be very clear. I didn't put it there. This is not talking about an environmental movement where, like, we accidentally spilled some oil and, like, we burned down some trees or something. Like, this is unbelievers who, who abused <laughs> God's creation, if that makes sense, right? They abuse God's creation. And so we have not about environmental. These are people that are unbelieving, and they have purposely tried to destroy God's creation. Again, it's not an attack on the environment itself, okay? Again, we're speaking in the future tense here of judgment, which we will see. Chapter 19 and 20, the dead, great, small, and wide, they're going to stand before the Lord. Are we going to stand with Jesus Christ? Our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life or no? That's what it boils down to. It's very black and white. It's very black and white. Verse 19, again, part of Psalms chapter 2, the temple of God is now open. It's in heaven and it's open. The ark of his covenant, it appears in his temple. Flashes of lightning, sounds of peals of thunder, an earthquake, a great hailstorm. Guys, you're in heaven itself now. That's a wow, isn't it? <laughs> That's incredible. Again, we make light of this. I mean, I remember seeing this the first time I saw the Ark of the Covenant. We know what movie. We saw it. What movie? Indiana Jones, right? I mean, come on. That's when I first, I never, I was raised, in, uh, excuse me, I was raised in the church, raised in a Christian home. Never heard of the Ark of the Covenant until like 13 because of this movie. 
Okay, now what does this actually mean? In the future, according to verse 18, God's wrath is going to come. We're going to be judged. Verse 19, you're either in heaven or you're not. But what, what 19 ultimately means, as you see on the screen, it's a simplified way of saying that God's covenant is now brought to fruition. You are now in heaven. You're part of it. Remember the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. It looks, you know, similar. I put that in quotes to that. But it meant that you were, you were with God's presence. And it was a small, small symbol of what it was going to be like in heaven. Hallelujah. That we are with him, worshiping him, and celebrating his presence all around us. Why? Because his covenant is now brought to fruition. We had communion last week. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. The blood of the, the new covenant. That where I am, you may be also. That his blood paid it all. Hallelujah. Here it is, verse 19. It's set in stone. We're going to be in heaven with him. His promise brought to fruition. I mean, hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, let's one more time. Bill, do it right. Come on, one, two, three. Wow. We're with the Lord himself. The Ark of the Covenant because of God, Jesus Christ reigning forever and his blood, his body broken and spilled out for you. Man, that's incredible. That's incredible. You know, we, we talk about, as we close doing an invitation, I'm telling you, I, I don't know how, what else, other better way to close than say, I want to be a wild church. <laughs> you guys want to be a wild church with me? I don't know what that looks like, but if you, deep down, I haven't said wow in a long time, then come on forward. I'll pray with you. We'll, we'll, we'll just sit, and I'm going to stay a little back behind today because I know in myself, I haven't said, wow. What happens? We start looking at the news. Uh, we start looking at maybe community or schools. And, or, or we look around and it's like, oh, uh, man, it's just a down. And we start to, start to stop thinking how God thinks. And he wants to see people saved. He wants to see communities changed. So when are we going to start saying, wow? We saw it, what, eight times today? <laughs> Let's be a church that says, wow. And if that's you this morning, come on forward. We'll sit and we'll pray. And I'm going to stay later. Just be in the presence of the wow, right? God himself. Father.